So, <coughs> hi, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to do so this uh, hour and a half of uh, Gradle Propel, Propel deployments. Uh, it's a kind of a mix of the talk I just uh, we just gave at the Jenkins user conference about how to integrate, uh, um, basically how to manage modules and modules integration, modules dependencies. And uh, here I'm going to talk uh, specifically about the Gradle Artifactory and the uh, Gradle Jenkins plugin and how they play together and how basically with Gradle you can find the sweet spot of uh, configuration uh, versus uh, convention and all these kind of things. Okay, so I'm uh, Fred Simon. All the slides here were made by uh, Barrow, uh, J. Barrow, Barrow Sadogorski. And so you can see that he has high respect for uh, for the founder of the, of the company he's working for, but uh, no, he's a really great guy, and you can see that uh, he really likes to do some uh, funny, funny slides, and I, I got into the mood. Took me some time, but now I, I managed to flow. So, uh, we're gonna talk about one main issue, is that first of all, well, let's say that you have a master branch. This is your master branch, and you want to do continuous deployment and continuous delivery, whatever is the final project, uh, of this master branch. And uh, so uh, once you have a master, you want to keep it clean. You want to make sure that not uh, non-tested, crazy deployment or uh, half-baked uh, feature are coming in. And so you create feature branches. Okay? When you want to do continuous deployment and continuous delivery from your master branch, Every time you have something big coming in and a big feature coming in, you create a feature branch. Okay, that's kind of uh, systematic, and with Git, it uh, flows, and uh, there is no real issue with it. And so you create a feature branch, and you have a twist. This is how what's going on today for most of Maven users or uh, 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 Jenkins Maven environment or the Gradle guys. You have a rigid build tool, which is here Maven which is basically how can I conditionally use a Maven Ant Run plugin. And here it's, when you do this feature branch, okay, one of the first things that you want to do is to do something special, basically to make sure that you don't pollute the results of the artifact or don't pollute anything that is going on on the master. And so you do all kind of profile, all kind of if, and all kind of build tools. So this is a really nice code uh, of Maven on how to do uh, the if. Uh, depending on an argument and to echo two different messages. This is very, very simple and very basic, but well, when you know how it goes with Gradle, uh, you kind of cry. So it's an if of an ant inside Maven, which has not enough space to put the whole uh, snippet. And so well, you kind of freak out and said, okay, what's going on? <laughs> what do I do? Uh, yeah, one of the main issues when you create this uh, feature branch uh, in Maven is that everything you're going to do on the feature branch is basically going to affect your build tool. <laughs> on the other hand, you have a rigid CI server. Whenever you want dynamic property or dynamic uh, system, it's, uh, well, it's not really meant to be. Okay? You have jobs, you configure the jobs, you can do parameterized jobs, but every time you do the parameterized to uh, manage all those parameters, Especially if you can actually know what are those parameters, you end up with doing all kind of uh, strange uh, shell execution that generate property files that are read by other systems and, and so on and so on. So, same kind of issue. Okay, so let's say that first you manage to configure your CI server for this feature branch. Okay, we are talking about, I have a, a CI server configuration which works perfectly for my master branch and now I want to do the same for my feature branch. Okay, so I start from scratch in Jenkins. I have plenty of fields. It's actually a lot, a lot better today. It's uh, collapsing and uh, all this kind, but it's still a long uh, uh, configuration process. And the main issue is that in the CI server, okay, if you do your configuration inside your UI and if you configure, it's inside the .xml. Okay, how do you keep track of the configuration and how do you kind of automate the CI server environment? How do you add dynamicity to the CI server environment? So this is what we try to solve with the aggregation of uh, Jenkins, Gradle, and Artifactory. So it's the whole pack and it's mainly based uh, so on the, the Gradle Artifactory plugin for the Jenkins and the Jenkins environment. Okay, 
what basically we uh, we did and what we want and what I want to show you here in the demo is uh, basically how to solve the rigid build tools to do some DSL. How do you want to solve the rigid build server? You do some DSL. How do you want to solve a version CI server configuration? You do some DSL. <coughs> <laughs> so uh, the good, uh, I mean, Hans, you really like that. Every time you have a problem, you just add to the DSL. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, it's, um, it looks like a joke, but it's, uh, it's really working like that. Once you try to find the best way to model your issue and to give the minimum amount of information about what you are trying to do, and you make the tool capable of reading this information that you provide based on these domain uh, uh, specific languages and execute the things that you expect the tools to do, okay, everybody works better. Okay, the tool works better because you provide the exact information and it's not overloaded with a bunch of XML code and the uh, unneeded uh, bloated line. Uh, and you uh, works better because you provide the exact amount of information and you don't have uh, too much, um, I mean, headache about adding and configuring all this kind of stuff. So for the DSL of the build tool, Gradle, so here we didn't do anything, we just added the Artifactory plugin, which is an Artifactory convention inside Gradle that add the DSL about the Artifactory configuration. Rigid build server, there is a DSL which is called the Jobs DSL, which allow you in Groovy to create dynamically Jenkins job uh, or uh, an, any kind of job. Uh, anybody of you uh, use it or try to use it? Okay. So uh, today this integration of this uh, Jobs DSL with uh, the Gradle environment is really nice because it's reading the Gradle model and being capable of uh, creating uh, a job inside Jenkins based on the information inside the Gradle model. And the last one, the CI server configuration. So it's uh, solved by the DSL of, um, yeah, it's basically based on the, on the top one when you have the Gradle server uh, generating the DSL. But here there is also the fact that the Artifactory DSL is uh, uh, reading both the Gradle and the server configuration. And uh, it's providing an, uh, an interface between the DSL uh, of the job that we created in Jenkins and the Gradle. So basically with the DSL everything is possible and you gain and solve all your problems. So basically with one properties and this is what we are doing today in, uh, in, uh, in the Artifactory and Artifactory Online and in, in a lot of the store and a lot of our application, it's one property that makes switch from a snapshot build and a snapshot environment all the way to production, okay? So it's pure property management and pure property environment. The main issue that we have with these properties is that, of course, they need to be dynamic, okay? Because those properties, they will change over time, they will change depending on your workflow, they change depending on your build, they change depending on all kinds of parameters, okay? So you need to be able to add dynamic property to your CI server, to your build environment and build uh, .gradle, and uh, of course, to your binary repository manager. So, and here again, it's solved with the DSL inside Grid. Okay, so DSL is my middle name. Let's have some fun. Hopla. So that's my ugly box. <laughs> okay, so, um, sorry for sitting down, but, so this is uh, the, uh, a nice uh, repo demo. This is on my local machine. This is an Artifactory server running on my local machine. Uh, how many of you are uh, familiar with Artifactory? Okay, so that's going to be okay. So, and uh, I, this Artifactory server was populated with a bunch of builds that are mainly coming here uh, from uh, the Jenkins on the side. How many of you are using the Artifactory build integration? Build info with Jenkins? Okay, yes. So uh, the main one that I did here, I have the simple Gradle project and the Gradle build info tests. So I'm going to do the build info test. Um, so we eat our own dog food. Okay, everything we are building and everything we are doing inside uh, uh, JFrog is using uh, the tool and the tool set and, uh, and the tool stack uh, that I'm presenting here. So we, we eat uh, all the stuff. So here it's the Gradle build of the build info of the plugin itself. Okay, so it's um, maybe a little bit confusing. But uh, so this was provided by the Jenkins environment and this provided to Artifactory all the information about uh, this uh, specific Gradle build info test. Okay, so that's the final results that will uh, enable us to go 
uh, from Artifactory to the uh, continuous de uh, delivery and continuous deployment phase. How did he got there? So here we have the link directly, bidirectional link to the actual build inside Jenkins that produced this build info. Okay, and if I go, I'm gonna go first inside Jenkins. I have uh, manage Jenkins and manage plugin. So I added the, the uh, in manage plugins uh, installed, there is the Artifactory plugin and the uh, Gradle plugin. Uh, where is the Jenkins Gradle plugins and uh, some, somewhere there should be the Artifactory plugin. Ah, this one, Jenkins Artifactory plugin. Okay. And inside Jenkins, manage Jenkins, what you do is once you add the plugins, you configure inside your system the list of servers that you want to interact with. Okay. So here it's the list of Artifactory server and uh, the, gen the username and password that you want to use for uh, integrating basically your Jenkins with your Artifactory server. Okay. What does it mean here to have this URL and this username password inside your Jenkins configuration? Okay. It means compared to a Maven environment where you have to define your distribution management and your server.xml with your, the ID that match one to another and the, the username password which is passing clear text password and all this stuff. All this is gone, okay? The only integration between your CI server and Artifactory is configured inside your CI server. You don't pollute your build tool and you don't pollute your version control, uh, um, your uh, control source, okay? With unnecessary information, which is basically where are the different servers of your continuous integration stack and where are the different pieces of your system. Once you have these bases, when you go to the job itself, okay, for every job, so this build info test, when you configure it, here, okay, you have, so here it's a Git repo which is on my local machine. You have here in the uh, different kind of integration, so you have the anti-V integration, the generic artifactory integration. Download some stuff and push some stuff after. Ah. Let's see if I can do that. It's good? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the anti-V integration, which gonna, so uh, here in IV, for example, to do this uh, integration, we had to inject a listener inside the ant and listen to everything that IV is resolving and listen to everything that IV is publishing to do our job correctly, okay? The generic artifactory integration is just downloading stuff before the script is executing and uploading stuff at the end of the execution of the script. The Gradle Artifactory integration, this is what we're going to talk about. And there is the Maven 3 Artifactory integration. And here again, for Maven 3, we had to add a Maven 3 library and plugin into, uh, so it's not a standard uh, Maven plugin, because basically what we want to do, we want to listen to everything that's going on inside the build, everything that is resolved, find out all the artifacts that are actually produced by your build, and at the end of a full build, publish all this information, all the builds and uh, all the build info to Artifactory, okay? And uh, so the only way to do that correctly in Maven 3 is to basically inject directly listen, uh, uh, real listener to the class loader and to the class path, okay? It's not a standard Maven 3, uh, but with Gradle, it's a pure standard Gradle, Artifactory Gradle plugin, and you can find the sweet spot between the two. What you have here, is that basically you have a combo box, you cannot make any mistake about the URL, uh, do some uh, when you write it. And you have a bunch of combo box here that are coming from uh, the REST API of Gradle that provide you a list of uh, virtual repository that are defined inside, uh, inside Artifactory where you can resolve all your artifacts for this specific build. So if you have your feature branch that is using some strange looking artifacts that is not used right now for the master and all these kind of things, you can configure it here. You don't have to change your build.gradle and you don't have to change your configuration and your version control system. And for the publishing repository, it's the same. This is the list of local repository where I can push my artifacts at the end of the builds. And here again, if I do my feature branch, I can come here and change this configuration and I don't have to change my build.gradle for every single feature branch that I'm creating, okay? So those two parameters, they're gonna actually come inside the Artifactory plugin. And there is here an even uh, Gradle Agile. And you can see that there is no even <coughs> Agile. Um, there is even a custom staging configuration plugin that we're gonna look after. 
which allow you basically to write some groovy scripts and uh, dynamic groovy scripts about how all this behavior of, uh, uh, of uh, creating a new uh, build inside the CI server is executed. Okay. Uh, this, I want to make it mandatory in uh, one of the uh, future versions. Um, yeah, this is quite important for uh, all, the, all of you guys that are uh, uh, big Gradle users. Um, at the beginning, to inject the Artifactory plugin inside the build, we used to inject it via the init.gradle. So we, had the in, we injected here an init.gradle that was generated by Jenkins that injected the Artifactory plugin to all your projects okay, automatically. So you didn't have to configure the Artifactory plugin uh, inside your project, inside your build.gradle. But once you do that, you cannot do the sweet spot that I'm going to talk about, which is basically letting the developer and letting inside your version control system configure some of the parameters of the Artifactory Gradle plugin inside the build.gradle and configure some of the dynamic properties and some of the dynamicity. Okay? So here this checkbox is telling basically uh, uh, Jenkins the build.gradle of this project already has the Artifactory plugin configured inside. It's already uh, playing with it. Just don't inject it again. And it's going to do this uh, uh, injection of the properties. Okay? You can change here the deployer credential. So this is highly used for big company and big environment. Okay? When you have a big, uh, um, a lot of different departments, it's quite useful to have uh, each uh, different build deploying with the different users. Okay, so you can do, uh, you can restrict deployment uh, to specific uh, repository depending of which feature or which department or which uh, guy you are. So for example, if you want to protect deployment to the master local repository where you're supposed to have your staging master artifact that will go all the way to deployment, okay, you need to have special credential. For your feature branch, you put here your uh, uh, developer uh, credential or uh, LDAP uh, encrypted password and you can be uh, sure that you can actually deploy to a, a staging local repo or whatever uh, um, a feature local repository. Okay? So the capture and publish build info is this process of the Gradle plugin to listen to everything that Gradle is doing about uh, resolution and to listen to everything that all the IV publication or Maven publication that IV is creating. Okay, capture all this information and create a build info out of it. Okay, a build info is a big JSON object that collects all this information based on what really happened during the Gradle build. Okay, you can include all the environment variable. I'm going to do it here. You can put all kind of include exclude pattern on the variable you want to do. And here I'm allowing the promotion of non-stage build. Okay? This is what we are using today. It's basically, I am capable now from Jenkins to promote any snapshots build, any continuous build that was done inside Jenkins and promote it to a higher level of uh, integration and to promote it basically to my cloud staging and uh, all this kind of stuff. Okay? Um, you can run here a bunch of uh, license check and publish uh, the, uh, here you can control, by the way, this is unique to Gradle, you can control what kind of descriptor you can publish. This is controlled also inside the artifact. Okay. So this is a bunch of fields, a bunch of parameters that you can change here inside, uh, uh, inside the Jenkins job for every feature branch that you are creating, for every job that you are creating inside Jenkins. But basically what it's going to execute, it's going to execute the build.gradle, which is uh, this one here. The build info.gradle here, okay, which as you can see here is including the, the build info, the artifactory uh, here, the artifactory plugin, okay. Uh, and here, so it's going to execute and do here, this, this is the part. Uh, you see uh, what um, can make it bigger? How do you do that here? So about that. Uh, you, can, you can see or... Um, tools. Okay. So I, I really don't know how to increase the size of this stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the main thing here is this artifactory, which is the artifactory plugin convention, okay, is the DSL of the artifactory plugin inside my build.gradle. Okay? So here I can start 
to add some information. And like I said before, uh, in the in the previous version, um, inside the CI server, you had to define what are the configuration you want to publish. Okay, uh, what are the properties here you want to add to all the different information and all the different builds and artifacts that are published? Okay, what what are the default repo keys you want to resolve from and and the context URL and all this kind of stuff was configured inside the Jenkins job. Okay, what we just saw. What's nice in this environment is that now the developer is in control. Okay of the different configurations. So there is two ways of doing it. Here is the publish config. This is the old uh, previews to Gradle 1.4. OK, uh, the new way to do it is here. OK, it's using now the Artifactory dash publish plugin. So the, the jar of the Artifactory plugin he has the Artifactory plugin and the Artifactory dash publish. OK, the Artifactory dash publish is the new Gradle 1.6 and above uh, publication and here what you declare is the list of publications which are declared here in the publishing block. Uh, how many of you are using the new publishing model? Okay, great. So in the new publishing model you have way more uh, information and way more flexibility about how you want to change the IVXML, to change the list of artifacts, to integrate with the components where they are coming from and so it makes it a lot a lot easier for us uh, inside the code of the Artifactory plugin to actually write the Artifactory plugin. So you don't really see it for you, but for us, it's uh, this Artifactory dash publish is a lot, a lot smaller and a lot cleaner than the previous version. Yeah. Is that part of the core now? Uh, yeah. The this one here, it's uh, incubating. Yeah. It's uh, so you need the version 2.1 of uh, the Artifactory plugin to have the. Artifactory dash publish version. Uh, so it's the version 210. You can see it here at the top. 210. But uh, since uh, here it's running with Gradle 1.6, uh, in Gradle 1.7, what did, what did you change, uh, Dan? Not much. Not much in 1.7. So, uh, so here it's uh, really, really easy to add multiple publications, multiple IV publications, multiple Maven publications. And I think uh, we're going to add uh, even more publication for C++ and for all this kind of stuff. But everything that is here after, for the, grade, for the Artifactory plugin to capture the model here and publish this model at the end uh, to Artifactory is a lot cleaner and a lot more uh, uh, user-friendly for, for you as a DSL writer, okay? And for us as uh, Artifactory uh, publisher, okay? So, um, yeah. So here it's a, a list of, uh, of things. And the other thing is that you can start to see here things that are impossible to do in Maven or in any other kind of tools is to add dynamic properties here to uh, your deployment build tool. Okay? Those properties are the uh, metadata property that's going to be injected inside um, uh, inside uh, uh, Artifactory, okay? And it's all the metadata that is injected uh, on the build info. Uh, there is even more uh, dynamic property here that I'm gonna show you. Configuration publish here, test compile. Uh, so you can see here this, for example, this ugly project here with the new uh, Maven publication is a lot, a lot nicer and a lot cleaner. This kind of stuff here, uh, we need to migrate this project. Uh, maybe that can help me, but there are, this is converted to uh, a, a lot less line of code in the in the new environment. It's a lot nicer, especially the source jar also, or adding source jars to the configuration. Uh, and so, what I want to show you is here uh, bin tray dot version. Okay, so this is uh, bin tray information that we put inside Artifactory so that the bin tray publish will do uh, the job correctly and automatically. And we can put here all kind of uh, uh, filter and, and, inf and uh, regular expression to actually tag the different artifacts with Artifactory publish dynamic properties. Okay, uh, One company that is using that uh, quite heavily is uh, Spring Source. So all the, the Spring Source release management and the, the Spring Source flow, they are using Gradle to do the build. And from Gradle, they are tagging uh, their documentation uh, files. Their, uh, they have all kinds of different files with the different properties so that it will start different workflow for the rest of the, of the project and the rest of the flow. 
Okay. So this kind of dynamic properties, um, it can so come out of the box with Gradle. Okay. Basically, we, we can do that also uh, in Maven, but if we do it in Maven, it's going to be static. There is no way to make those properties dynamic. Okay? But as soon as you're using Gradle and Groovy and all this stuff, it becomes dynamic, and it becomes way, way more useful than, uh, than Maven filter and Maven tag. Okay? So this is what is executed here when I do, uh, so I'm going to do save. Uh, let's do another build just to make sure. But I'm going to go here to the, to the previous one. Uh, so, you can see here, uh, it's just a, a git uh, update and a standard build, uh, uh, a a Gradle build, with a lot of uh, x minus l in to, to add, and we are dirty, dirty guys. Uh, and so, what's really, really uh, nice and important here is that you can see that all the build tasks are executed, everything was executed, all the tests was executed uh, on everything, okay, and voila. Okay, when I put the laser pointer, it's beeping. Uh, and at the end, really at the end of the process, okay, the publication, the configuration that were configured to be published are published here deploying artifact to Artifactor. Okay. Here there is three, four really, really important things that happen only in this configuration, okay? which is the build server. It works with Bamboo and TeamCity also, it's not only with Jenkins, okay? But the build server that is calling a Gradle build that is publishing to Artifactory, okay? The first thing is that uh, the snapshot here is not replaced, okay? Which means that Gradle Aether configuration of uh, man, uh, finding the latest snapshot and the dash uh, build number doesn't happen at all here, okay? It's the snapshot file that was created by Gradle with the POM file and the JAR files and all this stuff taken as is and sent to Artifactory with a good path, okay? There is no Ether involved and no calculation. What's gonna happen also is that once this deploying artifact, which is a put request using HTTP client, using the best wagon and the memory management to do the put request to Artifactory, it's passing also a bunch of headers and a bunch of header parameter in one put request about all what is the build name, what is the build number, what is the actual checksum of the file locally, okay? What is all this kind of information directly on the put request to Artifactory. What it's going to do is basically Artifactory gets all the metadata about this uh, deployment immediately and can do an immediate checksum check, okay? 80% of the checksum error in any kind of build or interaction with a binary repository manager is at deployment time. It's when you take your local file from your local build and put it on whatever uh, SFTP or uh, HTTP server or whatever. Okay, when you do the deployment, something goes wrong and your build tool is just sending the HTTP. It looks okay for him, but on the other side, the file is corrupted and you get corrupted jar. And once you get corrupted jar on your uh, remote server after, it's really, really a nightmare to debug and, and, and so on. What's going on here is that since the header are part, the checksum header are part, of the deployment, it's a immediate failure. If Artifactory that is saving this file is calculating a checksum that is doesn't match the checksum calculated by Gradle, you have an immediate build failure. Okay, we really, really believe in uh, fail early. Okay, we don't have uh, compared to our competitors that are doing all kind of reports and sending all kind of mails after the fact, telling you that uh, this and this are wrong or whatever. We really think that in a continuous delivery environment and continuous deployment, you want to fail early, okay? As soon as there is something going on, you want to fail, s fix it, and continue, okay? Do it again. And so this timestamp here, snapshot, if I go to uh, Artifactory, okay, so this is all the builds. Um, I have a link here which is going directly to the uh, Artifactory build info for this uh, specific build. This is where we were here at the beginning. And if I go to the publish module, I have the information about all the modules that were produced, the number of artifacts and the number of dependencies. Okay, and it, you can see here, um, so bad luck, he didn't do it. Ah, Gradle snapshot local. Okay. Yep, uh, let's take. One release. I'm gonna find one, don't worry. <laughs> okay, 
So, um, yeah, my uh, Gradle uh, snapshot local was not configured to do the uh, auto unique uh, mo monitoring, but so inside Artifactory, you can say that everything that goes to the de demo snapshot local will do uh, a numbering and will do the, the snapshotting. So this is what was deployed by, uh, uh, by Maven or Gradle, and this is what Artifactory is calculating automatically. Okay? So Artifactory is calculating automatically this timestamp and this uh, bill number, and so you don't have the... By the way, it's um, in JBoss, for example. In JBoss, they suffer a lot about this uh, numbering, okay? When you have Maven, it's kind of, uh, I don't know how, how they thought that it was a good idea, but Maven, when he wants to calculate this timestamp and this bill number and this unique uh, ID, he has to download the Maven metadata XML, check what are the latest value of all this stuff, change it locally and redeploy the file with the new uh, name and the new version and redeploy the Maven metadata XML with the new version. Okay? This is typical kind of work that needs to be done on a centralized server-side environment. Okay? It's a plus-plus environment which is global for everyone and it, it needs to be automated on the server-side. This is exactly what we are doing. And so the last part of the build here uh, which happen when, when you do the deployment, it's exactly that. It's calculating the Maven metadata.xml automatically. And so all the indexing and all the tooling that want to go like uh, Gradle uh, doing the listing of what are the latest version and the latest file, okay, it's done automatically here by Artifactory. So the build tool uh, doesn't have to, to do. Deploying Artifact, deploying, deploying, deploying. And at the end here of all these deployments, which are like I said, all those deployments are capturing the model that was the publication model or the configuration model created by Gradle and sending it to Artifactory. And at the end, there is this global build info object that is sent to Artifactory, okay, which is um, so this one here. Oh. Yeah, it's a little bit build info JSON. Okay, so this is a J the JSON object. The version is the version of the JSON uh, of this JSON 101. <coughs> uh, Gradle build uh, the build number, and so license build retention and the list of modules. Okay, the ID of the module, the artifact that are produced, and the artifact that are dependent. This JSON object, we have already some Python guys and Gem. The Ruby guys that are using it also, but uh, we have also the Artifactory, uh, uh, so the build info project itself here, which uh, allow uh, it's Apache V2, it's fully open source. You can take it and play with this uh, JSON object as much as you want, okay, and do all kind of stuff. With it. As you can see here, this object is a graph, okay, is a dependency graph based on what really happened on the build on the Gradle build, okay. It's not. Uh, okay, it's not capturing the, the whatever POM XML or IV XML or whatever uh, configuration. Okay, and uh, what um, uh, what Hans was uh, talking about and uh, Daz was talking about also about this issue of setting version range and having a selected version and uh, finding uh, and you have changing modules and all this kind of stuff. At some point, you need to have inside your system somewhere. Okay, the exact. Uh, 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 jars and checksums to be able to find out some, <coughs> some issues that happen during the time. Okay, so by having here exact checksum of the jars that are used during your build, okay, you will be capable of going back and knowing exactly what happened uh, at some point. And that's why, by the way, we provide also a diff tool, okay, that allow you to do a difference between two different builds and build info. And so g providing you here by the checksum, what are the dependencies that change and what are the, so here you can see, it. okay, the different, uh, the, the POM file, they didn't change, but the jar file were regenerated because uh, of jar jar, okay? So uh, based on the, all this uh, build info and build information, now we can basically uh, go and do a, a lot more and a, a, lo a lot more um, workflow and, and based information. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's go to uh, this one. Publish modules. Ah, this is. This one should be better, yeah. This one is released. Publish modules. 
This is the jar. So what I said before, <coughs> okay, on every jar, this is a jar here, and from this jar information, okay, I have the list of properties here. What is the bill name, bill number, okay, uh, bill timestamp. So this ability to tag a binary without adding to the manifest MF, reopening the jar or all this stuff to have dynamic properties and dynamic metadata, okay, on top of uh, a jar is something that is not used by uh, uh, ma many, many uh, build system and build environment today because basically uh, a s stupid file system like uh, people are usually coming from for the binary repository manager cannot support this kind of thing. Okay. But as you can see here, this kind of, um, this kind of information uh, can be used, so it has the VCS revision, for providing what we call uh, the full traceability. Okay? If you have any kind of files inside your system, in your deployment, in your test, or in your environment, you can get the checksum of this file, okay? do a checksum search here uh, inside uh, uh, Artifactory. Okay? You will find the file Hopefully, if it's not someone that built it locally on its machine and send it by mail, okay? But if everything is built by Jenkins and deployed inside Artifactory, you should find the checksum of any file that is running in production or in test. You do the checksum search, you go to the file that you found, and you have directly the VCS version, the build name and the build number, you know where this file comes from, okay? Even if you lost the name, it, uh, it happens a lot when you do work <coughs> file or all this kind of stuff, okay? So. Uh, the main thing here about, like, you, like I showed you before, the build.status here was dynamically injected by uh, Gradle to be of type release. Okay, so you have now uh, this dynamicity and this uh, dynamic behavior from Gradle about setting the good properties and the good environment right from the beginning. And uh, we hope uh, now we are working also on changing it and mo modifying those properties along the way uh, with the Gradle build also. Um, it's uh, mainly a promotion and, uh, and REST API uh, access. Uh, yeah, and those properties, they go and they, they stick to this jar uh, wherever they are and wherever they go. And um, because of those, I mean, it's not really because of those properties, but with those properties here, for any kind of artifacts, if I go to builds, I have the opposite uh, view for a certain artifact who actually produced this, okay, all the link back to the CI, and who actually used uh, these dependencies, okay? So the full graph navigation of what really happened during all your builds and all your environment, okay? Uh, showing CI server, I can go back, and I know exactly, okay, inside Jenkins, who actually published these specific artifacts, okay? Uh, yeah, and so the, the dynamic properties, li like I showed before, uh, on the build info, Gradle build info tests, Artifactory build info, up. You, yeah, it's a little hard for me to work in this resolution. But uh, as you can see here, all the dynamic property here about the bin tray version and all this kind of stuff were injected again here. I had also, uh, yeah, Gradle test. I don't know if you saw it was what I just did now. I added the Gradle.test properties with the, with the version two. Okay. So, uh, why, uh, yeah, how to use those properties um, is uh, so we use it a lot uh, inside uh, inside the JFrog for all the chef and the automated deployment of chef, okay, managing those properties. This is the file that is ready for staging. This is the file that is ready for a uh, uh, certain environment and, and production. Uh, and uh, we use it uh, also for uh, starting all kinds of uh, different processes and different workflow. And from Gradle environment, basically, when you are doing the resolution, you can uh, set up on the resolution URL and the resolution path filter rules and say, I want to get only the file that came from a certain build number or build root, which is what we call the uh, uh, build isolation and the build flow isolation, okay, to make sure that you get the file from a certain build when you do your resolution. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back to... Oh. 
Vai bugar demo time. Ok. Hum. Ok. So. Uh, so. The. The release process. So the, the main thing here that, that we talked about is uh, how you take a snapshot, okay, and you make you deploy it. How to deploy a snapshot and how to manage and make sure that you manage a snapshot all the way to deployment. Okay, there is a lot more to talk about, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, usually a two days uh, training course about how to to do the whole workflow uh, all the way to to deployment. So I'm not going to get into uh, too much detail, uh, but uh, the other part of what we really, really think should kind of uh, migrate to a, a new way is how do you do a release, okay? Today, uh, basically, a lot, a lot of releases are still done, and especially in the open source environment, from the developer machine, okay? Why? Because making a release Okay, is not the same than the automated build and the automated snapshot build that you are doing on your CI environment. Okay, for me it doesn't make sense. Okay, if the release is so special and if you are doing something different than your CI environment, how do you know that it's a good time to do a release? Okay, you're you're gonna run some different uh, uh, a Gradle task that's gonna do something different, and you're gonna end up with binaries that are maybe completely different than if you didn't activate the release. Or whatever we see a lot of release profile in Maven, and so and, and, and all these kind of uh, processes and, and issues. So having the release process as close as possible to the snapshot build and to the, the continuous and integration build, okay, is really really important, and it's something that needs to move. One of the main issues that people have is the time of the build. Okay, the, the time to do a really a clean release build takes too much time, so they don't put it as the, the standard workflow. This can change, and uh, with the optimization of the of the thing. Um, and the the other issue is the is basically there is some special stuff still like uh, numbering, knowing the version. Okay, knowing the release version that you want to use, if it's an RC one. If it's an RC2 or if it's a general availability one and all this stuff is a human decision, okay? And so there is, if you do an automated process and an automated CI, there is a time that you need a human decision to say this is the release number or whatever, okay? So basically we have two ways of doing that. We can do releases by redoing the build or we can do releases by using the binary repository, okay? Uh, so. This is something that is uh, kind of uh, strange, but um, we 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 actually do it more and more. Uh, oh, yeah. this is not good. Have to do this and go back here. Okay. Uh, once I have a release here, okay, I can do now. I can have. I have this little uh, basket. It looks like uh, <coughs> artifactory release promotion. Okay. So what I did is that I activated here the ability from Jenkins basically to make a release out of any snapshot, okay? And I have here a bunch of uh, promotion plugin that I can use uh, to do that, okay? I have the snapshot to release and I have the cloud promote. The cloud promote is what we talked about, which is property based, okay? It's just, uh, so uh, a cloud promotion plugin, cloud promote, where uh, basically we have staging, open source, production, uh, so the, the, the different layer, so we can put through, through, through. And what this plugin is going to do, is going to copy to the target repository all the files, okay, all the bulk operation of all these builds to the target repository, and tag those files with the good uh, properties that are ready for Chef to be picked up and to, and, and to do the deployment. How did we wrote this uh, Cloud Promote uh, uh, plugin? It's basically a nice looking, uh, promotion.groovy here. A nice looking uh, groovy script. So, uh, I mean, as a user, you, do, you should not have much problem doing it. What happened inside the Artifactory is that you have the ability to add any kind of groovy scripts for a lot, a lot of exit points. Okay, we are really the, the, the only one that uh, can do this kind of stuff. 
And uh, so here in the promotion, I declared the cloud promo. This is the one that you saw from Jenkins. Okay, so Jenkins is capable of reading this closure here. And a bunch of parameters, so AOS staging, AOS uh, and prod, this is what you saw. And uh, target repository, cloud deploy local, which is the, the default one. And it's taking the build name, the build number, and all the parameters here that are defined. So the build name and build number is because I come from Jenkins and it's special, special build, build name and build number. And here there is a bunch of Groovy scripts that works directly with the database of Artifactory, okay? With the actual binary artifacts, okay? One important point about Artifactory is that all this information is pure database, okay? You don't actually play with the files, okay? They just do links to the checksum file store. It's a little bit like the Gradle local cache. Okay, the Gradle local cache, he has files that are indexed by checksum, but all the metadata is, in, is not in the file store. The metadata is in the, um, in the uh, metadata, uh, what is it called, the DAS? The, there is the file store and the... Uh, the binary metadata store. Yeah, the binary metadata store. So they are separated like that, and there is a, a dynamic link that is done between, between the two. So Artifactory works exactly the, the same way. Uh, and so what you are doing here is that you are playing with the metadata information and the metadata object of your file, okay? So you can change the name of your file, you can change the properties of your file, you can move the files, and you can do all this kind of operation, okay? It looks like you are manipulating a file system, but at the end of the day, you are manipulating a database, okay? That makes a huge, huge difference. And so here in Groovy, I'm taking the, the build, the actual build information here, the build run, and for all the artifacts that were produced for these builds here, I'm going to copy them to the target repo and I'm going to uh, tag them uh, with, uh, with the good properties information. Okay, and I'm going to tag them, set properties with the property key and value that was passed as a parameter. So, not that big of a, of a groovy script. We are really bad in writing groovy at JFrog. It looks like Java, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but at the end of the day, it's doing the job. And the, uh, by the way, this is the actual code that we are using to monitor and manage our cloud uh, continuous deployment and continuous delivery. Okay, so it's not, uh, it's not like I'm bullshitting you. Uh, okay, so this is the cloud promote. The other one is the snapshot to release. Okay, so the snapshot to release here is really changing the file uh, changing the target repository and changing the file name and the POM XML and uh, all this kind of stuff, doing a lot, lot more work. So the code is a little bit uh, harder to read. Um, where is it? The build.groovy. Ah, I don't have it. Ah, yeah, it's here it is. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, taking the timestamp, uh, modules, it's regenerating the IV file and the, the deploy response file and all this stuff. So here it's a quite complicated and we really hope to find a nice way to do this kind of work with Gradle, okay? But the goal here, the main goal, is to be able to do all this kind of work without rebuilding, okay? Once you have a binary that you created that passed a bunch of integration tests, that passed a bunch of, of environment and, and all this kind of stuff, to say, ah, yeah, now they are good, and the first thing you do, you re-check out from your source code and you redo the build, okay? You're taking, a, I mean, for us, we, you're taking a risk, okay? The goal is to do all this job directly on the binary artifacts, okay? And it's possible to do it from the REST API uh, and here inside the database of, of Artifactor. Frederick? Yeah? Is this only available on the problem? Yeah. Is this new plugin, Slapshot, to we use? Hmm? Oh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's on our GitHub. By the way, if you want all those uh, groovy code here, it's on our GitHub uh, GitHub repo. So if you go to Gito Jfrog Dev, uh, uh, I'm gonna go. I think I'm going to open it. Uh, by the way, it's a. Uh, and I'm logged in. Sysadmin, Artifactory Users plugin uh, here. So. Here it's a bunch of plugins. There is some plugin that come, by the way, from Netflix, from LinkedIn, from uh, all kind of stuff. There is one that is quite useful for. Um, now it's not really true, but uh, at the beginning when Gradle was uh, IV, highly IV based, okay, there was the POM to IV. Yeah, <coughs> so it was doing the IV every time you download the POM, it converted to an IV file to be able to, to download it. So we do it here directly inside Artifactory, so that the other one don't have the all the build don't have to do it. Um, 
and so that there is a bunch of cleanup. Uh, this was written by Carl from uh, from Netflix. Um, uh, PGP sign and uh, Nexus push <laughs> was written by uh, by Spring Source by Chris Beams. Uh, so this is a different uh, security was written for uh, Oracle and all these kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, this is the, the, the bunch of plugin and it's available yeah, only in the, in the pro version. Okay. Uh, so the main thing I, I wanted to sh uh, show you is once you do here the, the direct uh, snapshot to release, but you don't have to do that uh, all the time. What you can do is, um, yeah, no, it's not this one. I'm really, really bad. Yeah, yeah. So here is the other version, okay, which is based on the Gradle Agile uh, staging plugin, okay, which allow you here basically to uh, release version and next development version uh, to basically specify what is the release version you want to create, okay, and what is the build you want to create, okay. So here it's redoing a build, okay. Do you, you can change actually a uh, repository to change, staging command, um, use uh, and all this kind of stuff. What's going on here, by the way, which is a lot, a lot nicer than, uh, than uh, with Maven or uh, uh, other kind of tools, those properties here are inside the Gradle.properties. What this plugin is going to do, okay, is going to take the value that the user is putting here, uh, changing the Gradle.property for this specific build, okay, on the current workspace of the, of the CI, doing the full build and full deployment to a special, usually, staging repository, okay. At the end, it's going to do a tag inside Git. Here, it's a Git tagging or inside the version, uh, subversion and perforce. We support the subversion and perforce. Okay, and uh, basically, it's doing this issue that when you want to redo this build, which is a, a, a release build. Okay, if you really want to, to do it, uh, this release build, you need to have this um, XA transaction. Okay, between the version control system, the build, and the deployment. Okay, and you need to make sure that you are tagging the good version of the version control system, that you did a full build and a full test that are coherent and are working correctly, and you have all your artifacts deployed to Artifactory and accessible by everyone uh, as the exact release. Okay, all those three things need to happen and be coherent together. Okay, so this is the way we are doing it. Coming in, doing a check, uh, check out of the latest master branch, changing the Gradle.properties, doing a, a local commit, but not a push, okay? Um, on, on the branch, actually, creating a, a, a git branch and doing a, a local push, local commit, doing the full build and the full deployment, and then doing the git push at the end, okay? So you have a full uh, full integration and a full, and it's in one single build compared to uh, Maven release processes or all this stuff, one single build to do this, um, this uh, release, okay? So this is the, the other way of doing Where I am? Yeah. Okay. Great. Now let's have fun. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about Dragon Story, Bedtime Dragon Story. Uh, I really, really like them because they are basically pushing to the, to the future and they are <coughs> the uh, module management nightmare. Okay, um, in a lot of uh, legacy migration and uh, legacy builds, it's usually one big build from one big source tree. Okay, and there is a, a not much uh, module management and module dependencies. Okay, but today uh, most of the those environments they try to go modularized. Okay, and you go a lot, a lot faster. If you do a lot of small modules and get rapid feedback for each module to your developers, and then you do big integration tests that marks and make it available to all the, the different developers, and then you make more QA, and then you make uh, go to staging deployment environment, and then go to pre-product deployment environment, do AP testing, all those kind of processes. When you are a modular software and when you keep your modules all the way to the end, okay, usually you go a lot, a lot faster. Okay, so the first thing is don't mess with the Gradle local cache, and that. <laughs> so yeah, don't mess with the Gradle local cache. You have the artifacts, 
okay, which is inside the file store, and you have the module metadata, which is inside the 2.7, and you have the jar and uh, the different folders under it, okay? Uh, it's true that it didn't change. I didn't know that uh, you, me, I was sure that uh, there was some locks, and so you could not really, really change. So I just learned that actually you can actually delete from the file store and uh, the module metadata will recreate and uh, regenerate it. So that's a good information. But anyway, Gradle is working on providing you a really nice uh, command line environment to manage this module metadata. Uh, so anyway, it's very, very smart stuff. Just don't touch it for now until they provide you with a good tool. But uh, one of the main... <laughs> Uh, question that we have, and especially, uh, for example, in Oracle with uh, Maven, uh, is that, uh, yeah, why uh, you don't have a uh, no cache man manager? Okay, it's to make sure that you download more and more, and uh, that you download the internet every time you want to do a new build. Uh, and so that's why, basically, uh, Artifactory uh, exists. Um, we really like to uh, provide uh, isolation and uh, a good cache manager. So the Gradle cache manager is the only one that provides isolation. Okay, like uh, you saw, Maven local repository is really uh, everybody that put anything here is accessible to anyone. So there is no isolation between the different repositories that are declared, and so you don't have any reproducibility. Okay, if someone downloaded something there. Okay, and it's accessible for the other build. Even if the other build has no repository that he declared that he can actually access this file, okay, it will be accessible for me. Okay, so we need to have a really good isolation inside the cache manager, and this is what uh, Gradle is uh, providing. The uh, other uh, uh, reason for the, the good isolation for us is to do the build isolation. Okay, when you have a cascading a build and, and, a, and a chain of builds, okay, you want to be able to make sure that a certain build is accessing only what is the result of the other one. Okay? And if you do with your local repository, you cannot do it. The only way is with Gradle and to put properties on the resolution path. Okay, another one. Vodka and beer. Do you know what is vodka and beer? I think uh, Hans should use it. Config and metadata. Okay, they don't mix. So this is one, uh, yeah. one great, great story and one great stuff about, uh, about Gradle, okay? It's to separate configuration and metadata and to do it uh, really nicely. And basically, this is uh, the configuration is inside the, the sources, okay? And the metadata are artifacts, okay? So metadata are saved inside Artifactory and are saved as, uh, as artifacts and they are providing you information about the artifacts and the modules, okay? But the way to build it and the, the thing is inside the source code. And Gradle is providing and reading and building those metadata files for the different build tool and the build environment to read and uh, after for the chef uh, and all this kind of stuff uh, to be able to publish, okay? So in Gradle, you have a nice separation. You have configuration in sources and metadata as artifacts, okay? Uh, which is, of course, not the case for a nice user that had a project uh, which is based on Maven, and so he declared a repository. He gets a nice dependency from this de uh, repository. He get the project B1, which is doing vodka and beer, and which is putting a repository declaration inside its metadata. It's changing config and metadata, okay? And once he gets config and metadata, it gets polluted inside his project and it shortcut and get a repository and you get some stuff that you don't know where it's coming from. Okay. So, uh, so hopefully, uh, so the, this is uh, one thing that we solved in, uh, inside Artifactory by removing those uh, declaration of repository inside the pumps. But um, this is also the goal of my talk about creating the feature branch. Okay. There is a lot of information that are coming from your CI environment and CI, uh, different tools, different servers, different test platforms, and all this kind of stuff okay, that should uh, be configurable from the configuration management of your CI environment okay, and usable by your different build tool and build task okay, as transparent information and transparent property. They should not be configured inside the metadata and inside your build. Okay. So that's a nice Maven user. Uh, <laughs> okay, so don't mix vodka and beer, configuration and metadata, they don't mix. So that's it. Uh, I finished with a, with a nice uh, vodka and beer and, and, and the talk. Uh, and okay.
minimize this. No, it's not good. This one here. And uh, I'm ready for any question about the nice environment of uh, Jenkins Cradle and Artifact. If um, we're resolving dependencies with the artifact plugin for can you filter the results based on properties? Yeah, that's the. So I can actually do. Um, I had an example ready, um, which of course I don't have here. This is a Gradle release uh, demo snapshot. Let's see if I have some stuff here. <coughs> I have only one version, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's a matrix properties. Um, Um, so yeah, it's configurable from the from the Artifactory plugin. So we, can do, uh, we have this uh, build root that is uh, allowing you to do this uh, property filtering. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to do it on this one here. So here there is the property build number four. Okay. So if I go here, this uh, 2.1 uh, um, 2.1 folder here is accessible from the virtual repo of Gradle. And uh, okay, this is by the way. If you see artifactory slash gradle slash org jfrog info, this is the kind of repository listing that Gradle is going to execute. Okay, here it takes time because it's actually listing all the Gradle here is the virtual uh, repository that aggregates a lot of remote repository, and so it's aggregating all the information from all the different remote repository to get the list. So you get here. So if you add multiple version, and if I did the non-unique uh, correctly, you will have multiple version with uh, different numbers. Okay, but what we saw is here they have the build dot number equal four, and so if I put here in my uh, filter, what is called matrix param, which is uh, build dot number equal five, okay, which is okay, and I do the listing again, it's supposed to cache. Uh, so the build dot number here it's a bunch of properties. Okay, this is how we do our, our query. You can see that the files are not there; the file disappears. Okay, and if I put four, which is the good one, okay, they will reappear. Okay, so this is uh, you just change in the URL. Okay, we want to do uh, a lot, lot more about those uh, properties in terms of dependency declaration. Okay, that's coming with the C++ environment uh, that uh, Gradle is doing uh, for all the C++ variants query and all this kind of stuff. So to reuse those uh, properties as variant of the metadata filter and metadata calculation. This filtering works for anything, right? Does yeah. The, uh, not necessarily just a uh, everything else. Uh, Every file that is accessible. Okay. Yeah. So the, for uh, for our cloud our infrastructure, so um, so there is the chef code. Uh, I'm not going to show because there is <laughs> the chef code contains a lot of configuration management and stuff like that. I want, but in the chef code we have the property filter based on the different chef environments. Okay, that are adding those uh, properties here to whenever chef wants to get. By the way, this is in LinkedIn also. This is exactly in, in LinkedIn. They do about the same also. When they want to get the war files that is matching the different environments. Okay, so it's asking uh, for for artifactory in a good position uh, for for these properties. Hmm. So um, uh, Hans talked about a pattern for large software stacks where you have some sort of independent third thing that knows the dependency tree yeah. um, and then so you have separate repos, separate components and then you promote certain versions um, and use latest promoted and if this seems like a good mechanism to do that but I'm wondering um, like how flexible is Artifactory to have, can you have like arbitrary metadata attached to these things so that you yeah. can have separate graphs or like to a branch across packages. Like, let's say you have two different teams that have two different software stacks that overlap and you don't want them to step on each other's toes. Exactly. So for, the, for doing that, what we use here usually is copy builds. Okay? So when you do, at the beginning, we had only copy artifacts. So you were capable of copying artifacts from one repo to another. So you can copy doing the part of the promotion Okay, is to take, okay, this snapshot is good for this team, but this other snapshot is good for this team, so you copy different artifacts. And now that we have the build info, you can do it at the build level. 
Okay, so once you have the build, it's bulk operation on all the build artifacts. Okay, so you promote. What's going on when you do this copy or this move or wh whatever you want to do to those different repos? You create usually a virtual repository for the different teams that have a visibility of different local repository and different, uh, different visions. And so f the main goal here is for Gradle, when Gradle say, okay, I want to get the latest uh, build info API uh, artifacts, uh, not to be aware about all this information. Okay, what they have inside the, artifact, the, the resolution stuff, it's a dynamic property that says, I'm part of this project. So this is my root URL, okay, Gradle root URL that I should resolve to. And Gradle is going to resolve and is going to get only the artifacts that are s suitable for this specific environment, this specific build at this specific time. So can you use, um, so you've got these virtual mm. repositories that yeah. kind of compartmentalize that. Can you say, show me this virtual repository at a specific revision or as of yesterday at 2 p.m. or something like that so that you uh, can control yeah. the change? So to control change, it's the build info, okay? When you capture the build info, you know that this specific build that happened at this time got this checksum. Okay, it's like in the in the checksum cache. So you know which checksum he actually used. Okay, so after by having this build info information, even if the file actually got removed because it's not the one you want to use, you know that this build actually used this file from this checksum. So this is how we we do the 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 build info history. Is your uh, is your version control of the of the graph, because each one of them is a graph and it goes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, up so, in if time. at any point in time you want to use an older graph, you need to use the build information. Yeah. Like so and and every time so, and so if you want it happen to uh, uh, in a lot of uh, different environment, and you say oh, this was the build that I really need. So you take a build info and you can take all the artifacts and all the dependencies and isolate them into. Uh, into a specific uh, local repo, like a for partner, or uh, I need to do more QA tests on this one. And so you extract and you copy all this stuff. What's important, by the way, when you do that, and for continuous integration and deployment, in LinkedIn, every time they do that, it's more than six gigabytes of WAR file and all this stuff, okay? So if they do that multiple times a day and it's a file system operation, it's just, uh, just doing, okay? Here it's database, it's just select update. And so you can copy gigabyte and gigabyte and gigabyte multiple times a day. There is no actual copy. It's just database repointing to the same checksum files and file store. So this is the way to to play and, and move with it. So can you can you say something? Well, you mentioned that you put the checksum just in the header of the HTTP. Yeah. Can you do or do you do something like I have this already? So can yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, I forgot about this part, yeah. yeah. I have four parts and I talk about only three. I forgot this one. Uh, when the, the build.gradle, and uh, this is really, really helping a lot of uh, big player and, and big build, is that when Gradle is sending the deployment and saying, I want to deploy this file at this location with this metadata and this information and this checksum, Artifactory, the first thing it does, it looks inside this file store uh, checksum and it says, wait, I already have this checksum. So it's telling Gradle, don't send me the bytes. It capture all the information and all the metadata, so it creates the file with all the metadata, and it links it to the actual checksum, but Gradle doesn't have to send the bytes, okay? So the build time is way, way, way shorter, and you do the deployment a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot faster. The only constraint is to try to make sure that your jar and your palm and all this stuff are recreating the same checksum files, okay? And uh, because of timestamp ins inserted into when you do the, the jar command and all this stuff, sometimes it's a little bit hard. But a lot of time you can do it correctly if you are, if you are careful. You're going to start to be careful once you start to have megabytes, 100 megabyte files to deploy. So if you are, you start to be a little bit careful of the way you are doing that. I'm not and it will about publishing hmm. stuff. It's about uh, resolving the stuff. So I often ah, yeah. have clients where they have multiple repositories with multiple components they yeah. publish among, I don't know, 50 scrum <coughs> or so, and they want to avoid traffic, right? And so we have to build again if the, if the artifact change, and so yeah. if we don't change it, we don't need to be built. Yeah, the avoid rebuild. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, we, there, there, there is a way, we have all the, uh, if you combine the Gradle model 
and the artifact on remodel of the, of the build info and all this stuff. There should be a way to do an up-to-date an up-to-date information kind of class and, and kind of uh, information like that. Uh, it's not there yet, but I'm really, really yeah, hoping. Well, uh, to some degree, the up-to-date shape, it's not about the up-to-date shape in the task, it's about mm. shaking uh, something in the cache has changed, right? Yeah. Like yeah. This isn't the case. <coughs> so, no, yeah, Gradle will query, uh, give me the latest snapshot, and he will see what are the checksum he already has for yes, these snapshots. Yes. And, uh, and uh, yeah, by the way, um, uh, Das didn't show it before, when Gradle is doing uh, head requests <coughs> on a possible POM or on a possible JAR, on the head requests, we are providing all this information to Gradle. And so Gradle knows immediately, ah, oh, it's the same checksum, and so he's not doing the, the second get to the dot JAR one and stuff like that. With Artifactor is one head request, he gets all the headers and do the link. So yeah, Gradle knows that the file didn't change and it's, uh, he already has the same candidate. But it's not linked, from what I remember, it's not linked to the, um, to the up-to-date mechanism. This is my issue. To, to some degree, because in the up-to-date mechanism, the, the input is the... The, the checksums. Oh, okay. It's just checksum based, so it shouldn't change. It's yeah. Okay, so that should work. That should work. Yeah. Considering that Artifactory has all the, the metadata, mm -hmm. is, does it have a mechanism to show a visual graph, a dependency graph? No. <laughs> no. Um, where, where did we learn? Yeah, it's more uh, something like uh, how G uh, Gradle could use that and Gradle can present that. But uh, yeah, it's. Um, uh, I think some IV stuff um, has capabilities to do that. Like if the IVD plugin for Eclipse can do that, and, and there's some tooling around that. So I presume Artifactory can provide IV metadata to like if yeah. So uh, Netflix is, uh, but uh, they, they wanted to open source it and finally they wrote something else. But uh, they had something that uh, aggregate all the IV files. So they have a plugin in Artifactory that aggregate all the IV metadata of all these different things into a file and provide this file to a Scala tool that create this graph and, and do this graph. But they didn't do it on the, on the build info. Yeah, I would really, really like it to, to have something. But, uh, well. Artifactory is, uh, is really a storage, storage engine, okay? We really see ourselves as uh, Artifactory as the kit for binaries, okay? A subversion for binary, cheap copies and all this kind of stuff, okay? In a version control system, a binary is always a burden, okay? It's a big file that doesn't change. It has one name and it doesn't change and it, it doesn't have any history. And you delete it and when you delete it, you really want to delete it and you don't want to keep the fact that you deleted it and uh, all this kind of stuff, okay? So a binary is the burden for most version control system. And w in Artifactory, we took the opposite, okay, by doing this database to check sums. We really changed the way you do version control system. We know that the file doesn't change. Once it has a name and a checksum, usually it doesn't change, okay? And what happened is that you actually change the name to uh, the same underlying uh, checksum and you have the garbage collection on the checksum. So we took the binary has an advantage to allow you to do workflow and version control system on top of it. Okay, so that's, that's the main, main goal of So, as a storage engine, most developers, I mean, we know a lot, a lot of developers are using Artifactory and don't even know it, okay, because just get binary from there and push binary, it's transparent. It's just, a, it's like uh, when they use Git or Subversion, they don't go to the UI of Subversion or Git, they just interact with it get the bytes back and forth, and, th and that's it. So that's more than 90% of the way people are using Artifactory. So um, a UI graph and things, it's gonna be, I hope someone is gonna do it one day. It's, it's not what we, we're gonna do. As an Artifactory uh, Artifact 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 Actually, I, I could have gone to the the best one is the the build info of um, no, it's not this one. Yeah, Gradle multi example here. So here you can see for all the build info here, you see you have the same number twice at different date. This is uh, a snapshots to release. 
Okay, so it's a clone. This one was cloned to be released. Okay, uh, there is a stage here, uh, stage release. So usually the um, there is two ways of modifying the build info. Okay, there is really cloning it. You take it, you clone it, you create a new one. Okay, and you republish it, or uh, you add a status here. You do, you add a release status at the end. Okay, which is just. Not modifying all the build info information, just changing its state. Okay, change, changing the status state. And every time you change the status state, you can use a, a bunch of groovy, uh, um, groovy code about verification. Okay, I don't have the right to move from uh, staging to uh, 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 QA if all the integration tests didn't pass. So you said uh, if I have some jar that didn't pass the integration test, you block the promotion. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is one big uh, thing. Uh, people they say uh, there is also verification of licenses. So we have license control, uh, black duck integration, or all this kind of third-party dependency. So there is some customer that ask us, yeah, if I have a GPL as a dependency, I want to fail the build. Okay. We don't believe in this kind of uh, of system. What we believe is that whenever you have automated build and uh, fast build, you go to the staging repo, but you cannot get out of the staging repo if you have a GPL. Okay, so it's kind of make the binaries, put them inside Artifactory, and then apply any kind of uh, post workflow and post build and and integration test and things like that based on those property and verification. So yeah, uh, I answer your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the, one of the best way to look at uh, uh, playing with a really big build info uh, is actually uh, repo at uh, springsource.com. So I'm using my phone here for going to the outside. Yeah, you can see I'm using T-Mobile <coughs> repo.springsource.org. Okay, here it is. Uh, yeah, I, I never remember. Wow, we have a lot of stuff. So this is all the the spring build, the spring social, spring integration. So you see they build all the time, okay? Uh, and uh, spring integration, groovy DSL, and they do the release from there. You can see stage stage. It looks like there are some problem to release this. <laughs> so they stage three times. But uh, that's the way the, 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 the. So could you, um, when you mark a build as stage, when you like create, mm. it creates a copy, it marks it, whatever, can you do several modules atomically at once where like it marks them all or marks none of them so that there's no race condition with people querying for that? Yeah, so, so that's the point, is that uh, First of all, by doing uh, when you do a normal uh, Gradle deploy or whatever, it's uh, deploying module by module. Okay, in Maven, it's even worse than the Maven deploy. So here, by the artifact to republish, all the publication is at the end. Okay, so it's already a lot, a lot better in terms of uh, race condition of uh, uh, of modules because all the, the artifacts are deployed at the end. Okay, it's not atomic at this time. Okay, but a staged or a copy is atomic for Artifactory. It's taking the bulk of the uh, artifacts that are produced and copying them to uh, another visibility uh, uh, operation. So, so it makes it it makes a coherent set of artifacts immediately so visible to the developers. Because it's just manipulating metadata, it's very mm -hmm. fast, but it still does do like uh, do them non atomically, like <coughs> one after the other. Or like what I'm saying is no, it's a DB transaction. It's all DB transaction. Oh, so it's a single DB tra transaction that does that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. You have a way to break it if you want, but by default it's a single TB transaction. It, uh, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> huh? If you uh, move the whole 93,000 artifact of a repo, <laughs> that uh, the single transaction can be a problem. So we are looking at, uh, it's kind of hard, but how to say, uh, sometimes I want multiple transactions, sometimes I want a single. Huh? Yeah. yeah, it's gonna still be hard on the database. So. <laughs> so. Any other question? Well, since you're there, how how big can Artifactory get? What's your biggest Artifactory? 
so this one is uh, uh, gr Gradle is actually <laughs> so uh, this is 450 repo.gradle.org 1.5 million <laughs> <laughs> you know why? You're using it for uh, for uh, you know 1.5 million. Uh, How easy is that to turn into disk space? Huh? Disk usage. Yeah, here. How much artifact count? Repo one cache. So yeah, no, we have uh, uh, LinkedIn. They have uh, one point one point two million artifacts and three terabyte. I store. How much do you have here? Yeah. Yeah. We're already at uh, 5 terabytes. Oh. 5 terabytes. Yeah. Yeah. 4 terabytes. Okay. Number is smaller. Yeah. So. Why is it that Soda type hates the idea of copying artifacts or promoting them? Uh, to, to make our job easier to sell artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 734,000 artifacts from Repo One. So you use it for uh, for as uh, a Repo One cache, which is nice. I I don't mind. <laughs> but uh, that's, so that's the the public. Uh, that's all the developer of uh, Gradleware and all the people that are building Gradle and everything. So this is the repository they are using to do all the build and the, and the deployment and the, and the publication. We are at 1.5 Yeah, 1.5 uh, uh, No, and the biggest one is uh, the biggest one is actually ours, repo.jfl.org. This is our public 2.5. Is that the one that supports picture? Huh? Is that the one that supports bin tray? No, the, the uh, well, we do from here, this is our open source, so we publish from here to bin tray for all our open source stuff. But uh, no, for Bintray you have the Ojo. Uh, Bintray, how many are? Uh, oh, this is my. Uh, yeah, I have to do. Rigo Mates. Everybody knows about Bintray? Uh, Shift Control N. How many there are in Bintray? No, Bintray they have. Uh, but uh, they don't count the file, they count the packages in, uh, in bintray.com. So they have 62,000 packages. But uh, a package is a, a bunch of modules that have the same version lifecycle. So for build info, for example, it's uh, six sub-modules, uh, six multi-build, and it's one package here. So uh, a wicket also is one package. And it's good. So, uh, Netflix, one package. so yeah, bintray is, uh, is basically once you have a release and you want to make it available to everyone, Okay, that's the, the place to go. Uh, and here there is a lot of really cool uh, Gradle plugins. Um, okay, 96 and... Uh, <coughs> uh, here, this one. How many years? Ha! Gradle cloud this plugin. Good. Ah, oh, yeah, it's not this one. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Cradle plugins. Here it is. Cradle. Here it is. This is the main one. So the goal is here to aggregate. Ah, oh, no. I go back always to Benjamin. Eight packages already. Yeah. Okay. Wow. There are some people that are doing a lot of plugins. More yeah, packages. Help. Need to find uh, David. So you, you see a lot of guys here are pushing that other plugins. The goal is basically to have Gradleware aggregating all those packages under one single one. So you can link. Uh, here I don't have the, the proposition. The goal is to link and uh, aggregate all the packages. 
Is there a logical way to link built artifacts that are already an artifact? For example, you have, if I have an application, say Foo, and the Foo is a, you know, consists of A, a jar, B, a jar, C, a jar, and yes. artifact already has all of that, is there a way that I can yep. logically link them to say Foo.war consists of these few artifacts? The war file, you mean? Uh, just an application, just you know, the Foo, the app, Foo application consists of these, these three artifacts. So Inside the, Artifactory, so it's the build? Uh, no, I'm, so not, I'm not packaging, I just want a logical link. I want to search for an application that says, oh yeah, this application consists of these three components. Is there a yeah. logical way to link? Uh, no. Okay. I mean, uh, the, the, the in Artifactory, the, the build info, so if you find a, a component or a jar, and it's produced by a build, mm -hmm. so you can go back to who produced it. And for this specific module, you have the list of dependencies. Oh, just query the build info. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. So you, you go back to the build info. Okay. Now, if it end up inside the war or not, uh, it's, uh, we yeah, don't capture this information. We just capture what are the jars that you downloaded to actually when you actually built it with the checksums. But that's the, the, information, that's the extent of the information. So, um, I, I kind of want to ask a, a slightly more open-ended question, but first let me just say, basically, um, this is what we're currently doing. Uh, feel free to snicker. Uh, we have all these jars. We have a huge, huge, like our artifacts are enormous. Uh, we produce them all. Trust us, it works. Uh, but then we have the process where we actually build our installers, and we're currently using install for j which sucks, don't do that. Mm. But um, that's what we're doing. And so we built these huge, like, six gigabyte distributions that our Ford employed mm. guys actually, you know, carry to our customers and do stuff. Yeah. Um, there's, maybe there's a better way, maybe there's, you have some advice, would you recommend shoving six gigabyte installers into Artifactory? I'm gonna guess yeah. not. <laughs> no, 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 we have, uh, we have a lot of users that are doing that. ISO files, uh, big install file, uh, they, they are doing, so, the thing is that for the continuous delivery process, to keep exploded module as long as possible for all your tests, integration tests, and all this stuff, is the best process because it goes a lot faster, okay, and, and it's, a, it's a lot, a lot, I mean, easier for the whole process to manage small modules. But at the end of the day, you want to create this file as, as late as possible once you pass as many tests as possible and make it available for the for all your customers and and because uh, if you do it later you get less instances of it so, yeah exactly okay. um, and if we could get rid of install for j and just be making tarballs mm. then we wouldn't necessarily have to save those or just the metadata used to make them because that's yeah. basically what so if you do the generic <laughs> artifactory plugin for example <laughs> or if you use a, a gradle specific task to create this tarball the build info itself, we have some customer that just take the build info itself as some kind of source of truth of what's inside the table and do the query on the build info for what's inside the table. Cool. So that's uh, something that's possible. So the guys that are using Chef Puppet and provisioning mm -hmm. their artwork and things like that, are they using something like Artifactory to store the RPMs and the yeah. time cap releases? And the Exactly. So we use uh, RPM also, so yeah, I didn't show it, but uh, in Artifactory, we calculate the YUM metadata automatically, so you just create a YUM repository, and you just shove RPM inside it, and Artifactory will calculate the YUM metadata automatically. And so, for example, TiVo, they have a huge amount of RPM, and uh, after they have all those Comcast and all those providers, so they have all kinds of groups, and they used to do it with the file system. And so they used to copy all those RPM again and again between all those different folders, Okay, and now they do it in Artifactory with all the linking, and so they can do it a lot, a lot faster. All the RPM, they are just migrating from multiple repos, and they are visible, because there is the one for Comcast, the one for the, all the different partners that they want to expose, and it's the same list of RPMs. So the guys doing Chef Recipes are saying... Yeah, take, take, take the, the latest Comcast version of this uh, YAML repo. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So if Artifactory understands RPMs, POMs, IV, all this stuff, is it if there's something it doesn't understand you, you want it to, can you just write it? So, yeah. Uh, no, not yet. We, we, we want to open it, but for now, so we have Debian coming in, Ruby. Uh, the Ruby one are uh, really, really uh, going along really nicely. That's the uh, Python coming also. And after uh, all the, the Scala, and SBT also. Uh, the SBT plugin, metadata kind of, kind of provider. But, um, 
yeah, it starts to be a new get. We understand new get also. Uh, so, but it's it's a lot, a lot of different repository format, a lot of different index. We understand P2. P2 was. Uh, <laughs> How many of you are using P2? <laughs> uh, for the for the story, we, uh, we have Artifactory Pro. <laughs> <laughs> for P2. So uh, it's one of our guys that uh, started to do P2, and, and he was uh, he was. Uh, so much suffering, I was sure that he will quit uh, JFrog at the end of the P2 uh, <laughs> aggregator work. So I took over and uh, it was two months of my life that I wish I... <laughs> I forget. <laughs> now the P2 metadata is a uh, really strange experience. It's Wizard of Oz is more reality than the P2 metadata model. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we do all this stuff. Thank you.